Balmain Boyd from way back, um, former opposition leader in New South Wales, um, now the uh, boss of Landcom, CEO of the, of the state's land development agency. Welcome, John, to uh, the Digital Dialogue. Chris, thank you for the invitation. We both look good with the cans on, don't we? Yeah, so, we don't. Yeah. Well, my staff always say uh, I'm just landing the plan, the 345 from Brisbane as it comes into <laughs> mascot. Soon I'll, to be. I'll, I'll be Lawsy UV Jones here. Yeah. We'll get the golden microphone here between us. <laughs> Hello, Will. Um, mate, um, I said Landcom. It's, uh, it's almost a bit of protected species these days. In New South Wales, there's been a bit of a, a bit of agency consolidation. It's fair to say in recent times, we... Barangaroo authorities no longer on the horizon. Urban growth, the group you were you chaired back in the day is gone. SOPA's board's been removed. Um, there seems to have been this mood to consolidate within planning. Why are you guys so great that Lancom gets to <laughs> continue to, apart from making money for the government? Oh, well, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, we are a state-owned corporation. We do pay dividends. So I think that's part of the, the government's strategy for keeping us in place. That also, if really, if they wanted to move us, they'd have to change our legislation. But that's the sort of, that's the, the hard negative side. I think the positive side, and there's never been a better time than now, probably frankly in our 45 year history, as to why the government does need a property developer. And that is when you go into an unprecedented, or at least in our lifetime, Chris, an unprecedented economic experience, um, pause to remember a government one. This is not a market yeah. situation we're in. This is a government making a massive health decision with extraordinary financial implications. Not criticising it, it's just fascinating when you think of it. Um, makes it even more unique. And property, Sydney is a property town. That's the yeah. uh, one thing I remember, Chris, when I was um, in Parliament and I was made the Shadow Minister for Planning by Kerry Chikorovsky and I thought, what have I done wrong? You know, this dreary bloody portfolio. Nobody ever worries about planning. I worked out within three weeks that the Minister for Economic Development in New South Wales is the Minister for Planning. We are a, we are a city that is driven by development, construction, infrastructure and the like. Um, and so from that perspective, this is a perfect time to have a government owned land agency to keep people in business. I mean, we keep our wheels rolling, we keep going. That means that uh, people who build houses keep going, people who provide professional services keep going and the like. And it's also an opportunity for the government to physically express and directly express its housing strategy. These days, uh, we'll come back to the housing strategy because your friend of mine, the Premier, is, is going to be out and proud with that. But back in the day, Landcom was land rich, cash poor. Yes. In a way, that's flipped a little. You're now yes. a, a buyer of land as well as being yes. a developer. Of, you know, you're, in some ways, you're a development partner for a lot of public sector agencies yep. and unis and others. And at my time at Western Sydney Uni, we did a great partnership at Campbelltown with Land Conference. Brilliant. Actually, paid for all of our, our um, Syrian refugee scholarships and other yeah. things. Um, so you're doing that side, but you're also in the market as a buyer of land now, aren't you? Which is a turn turnaround for Landcom. Yeah, we'll be uh, developing out the surplus land at uh, Glenfield at the um, Helston Ag College. The college will remain. There'll still be a selective school there. There'll still be a local school there. And indeed, there'll still be um, some level of agricultural education happening as well. But there's a very large piece of land, brilliant piece of land um, right next to a railway station that divides off into two lines. Um, brilliant part of Sydney needs jobs Kirsten, there. Kirsten Fishburne announced today as going from Liverpool Council to planning, including an activation zone in Glenfield, one of her yes, announced yeah, areas. So. Which is great. Big loss for Liverpool, big gain mm. for the department um, with Kirsten. But I understand why, but she'll be, a big, she'll be much missed at Liverpool. Yep. Um, she's done a great job there. In fact, yep. we have a, I mean, and I don't mean this to pee in anyone's pocket, Brownie, but we do well, have. this is mine, then feel yeah. free. <laughs> Let we me open my pocket have, for you. Yeah, yeah. We do have some really skilled CEOs, GMs of those councils out there mm. at the moment. And just as, you know, Western Sydney's time has come uh, in so many different ways, and, and uh, those general managers have done a brilliant job, along with their mayors, but the general managers yep. in those jobs all the time have done a great job. But for us, yes, we're, we're moving in at that Glenfield site. We're looking at another large site. Maybe state government could emulate site. national cabinet with a state cabinet where <laughs> the GMs meet with the Premier on a regular basis. Well, it's that's right. Yes, yeah. Um, you're getting excited, aren't you, Brownie? You, 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 that'll be in your next press release, won't it? Must it be, must be a collective me noun for mayors. I haven't worked out what it is yet, but at <laughs> the, the end of the interview, we might get a there. A murder of crows? Or, no, something, uh, like. something like that. So, um, 
Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're looking to buy land at the moment. And yep. the, the, the importance of that is that we can get moving on that land. We can get it out there and um, whether it's zoned or, or needs to be rezoned, whatever it might be, um, a lot of people, and, and look, we're talking on the 1st of July, Chris, um, you know, I heard the figures again, housing's down, housing prices down again in, in Sydney, down nearly 1%. Everything we hear is worrying about the future. Qantas got rid of 6,000 staff last week. That's 6,000 people who won't be buying a new home anytime soon. And so look at that in the Western Sydney context. Yep. Some would say, if you're being a critic, that we could almost be almost a Ponzi scheme based on residential development and government provided infrastructure. That's a large part of the sustainable economic um, environment for Western Sydney. Now we're pretty confident the infrastructure role is gonna keep happening from government. But what happens to our economy, to our society, if we do see the, the migration numbers will be well down for the next couple of years, so migration driving uh, residential development, the tradies live there, uh, who work there as well. It's a circular economy. Yep. You're uniquely placed. If, if we see a significant drop in, in, in demand for residential development, that, that's, that's, that makes a big impact in our region. Yeah, massive, massive impact. And, you know, the Jeff Roberts speech that no one delivers better than him, we've all heard many times, and is unforgettable from the perspective that we don't have a housing shortage in Western Sydney. We have a jobs crisis, a job shortage in Western Sydney. And we would be part of that because not just yeah. the blokes in their utes who are as important as anyone else, but the, the all the other professional services that go around that as well are just critical to maintain. And uh, I'm interested, you, you, I've not heard that suggestion that it's a Ponzi scheme, but I often think, you know, Chris, and I used to think back in politics that all this, you know, we've got to make the project stack up and it's got to go through a process, et cetera, et cetera. I don't reckon anybody did a process when they built a track train, train from Sydney to Parramatta. You know, there was a, there is an extent to which build it and they will come, and that's what you elect governments for to have vision. So a lot of this I don't think Lachlan Macquarie had a lot of you know business case support. No. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. A bit, it, or, or a lot of optimism bias built into yeah, the Yeah, well, that's review. right. And, and we know, we, look, what, I'll tell you what we do have is we have 250 years of um, white settlement in Sydney that is reasonably predictable, reasonably yeah. predictable. And Sydney's a radiator city because we hit a hard coast. Um, I like a, a bit of water at a train station. And there's yeah, a, you know, yeah, yeah, and we have, and, and, and what's fundamentally changed Sydney, and, and I don't know if it's chicken or egg, but what has fundamentally changed Sydney is that airport because it's now given us the other end in the south where where sydney not quite stops but if you know what i mean where, to where it will grow in the short term and th there's enormous optimism out there in in greater so land comes not only an economic um part of our city but socially you know you and i had a running with some of the you know the locals of ads recently when i tried to suggest that we might move that jail away from uh, next to the primary school and the high school but yeah. You've done your own work in ads with the new development, um, the salt and peppering. You're doing a lot of work with social housing. Um, and one of the reasons I would strongly support the, the extension of a, of a land comp, answer my own question before, was that you need to be the exemplar on environmental development to yeah. lead the way. You need to be the exemplar on, on, on community and social housing elements within to lead the way. Um, these are things that the private sector, uh, the use of technology and whatever, can, 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 and, and, good, and good design. Yeah. Um, these are things that will fall to a government agency quite appropriately, because as it should, and hopefully others follow you and you can you can prove it up. To that end, you are doing a lot of work with the, uh, in social housing at the moment and some of your developments. Um, Ed's, uh, Minto, what have you learned out of, out of that so far to be put in the next wave? Yeah, well, well Chris, thanks for recognising all of that. And I know you've been fantastic on this and, you know, what you and I talk about, you've talked about for longer than me, is what message does it send a suburb where you've got a primary school, a high school and a juvenile justice centre all next to each other? And um, and that's changing. And, and internationally, and we adopt this in Australia, the, the formula that people think works in order to change the fabric of a community, a suburb, is 70-30 split, 70% private, 30% um, public housing. And w we did a fantastic project. We did it with the Land and Housing Corporation, who are our partners there, or we're their partners. We did it with TAFE New South Wales. And it was um, a job-ready sort of program. This is two, three, four years ago. And it, you got to work out whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, right? When you do these sorts of things, and I'm an optimist. So we did this project, we had 10 people and they weren't all young. They were sort of as young as 17, as old as 35, all lived locally. 
all lived in homes of multi-generational poverty and welfare dependency where nobody's ever showered and shaved and gone to work in their home. They've never physically seen that happen. So we put these guys through a stop and go program and CPR and basic things that you'd need to get your first level construction job. And uh, we had this uh, community um, celebration where we awarded out these, these certificates to these people. And, you know, families came along. This is the only person in their family who's ever got any piece of paper to hang on any wall. Yeah. And the guy who'd helped run us grabbed me at the end and he said, oh, Mr. Brogdon, can I have a chat? He said, none of these kids have licenses. None of them have cars. And you, so you, at that point you could say we failed or at that point you can say we went close, we're one step closer to fixing these things. We provided guaranteed jobs to five of them. One of them is still in, in that job. You could also say, gee, only one out of 10. My view is, wow, one out of 10, <laughs> one more person's on the employment. <laughs> and the one more person's got a job who didn't have a job yesterday. Absolutely. And so these things, you know, you just can't give up. You can't give up. And we had a fantastic um, uh, sale the other day, Chris. We sold to a, a Australian woman, Indian heritage, who grew up in the housing commission as the old language, the public yep. housing in uh, Aids. She became a nurse, married a couple of kids. She's now buying back a piece of land to live in Aids. Oh, that's uh, great. And that's, you know, what a, what a full circle exciting story that is. And that changes the culture. So people will, in years to come, talk about Aids positive, well, in a different way do they talk about it now. And if and people and, don't get Aids, I mean, as you said before, you've got literally high school, a primary school, yeah. and a at a serious kids' jail. This is yeah, not yeah, fun, yeah. Why, why, the, why, the whole thing. Yeah. Go, go. And um, I was told, you know, I was done in the early mid-70s. And, you know, you and I have a lot in common. March 28, born, yes. you know, good yes. working class Catholic backgrounds, etc. <laughs> but the one thing different is you're just slightly on the side of the line between Labor and Liberal. I am. You can't believe the joy that I found out was an Askin government, not a Rand government. Ah. Issue to put the jail there. <laughs> well, My there collective you go. guilt was removed. There you but, go. Uh, well, you but it's to, interesting. You're about to fix it. And that, oh. to get that hope out of yeah. those communities comes exactly what you're talking about. Um, the fact that you can aspire to better design, yeah. the old house that stuff shouldn't be left to where it no. is. This and, really and, is an opportunity. And Chris, I, I, I honestly think good people made a good decision back in the 50s yeah, or 60s to you. like to, to have Campbelltown here, have a long road out, a long winding road, then whack in 100% public housing on dirt cheap land because people needed somewhere to live. Um, and I'd which love to was, see the minister... Working class housing. Exactly. Was, uh, well, back then it was is, yep. it, what we call key worker housing was, yep. was working out. I mean, I've got, you know, mum's one of nine, two of her sisters, you know, got married in their 20s, left Balmain and went to Seven Hills and Miller respectively because that's where working people could afford to live. That whole game's changed now, but I often like to see the minutes of that meeting to, to see what I did the flip from was. Parramatta to Balmain, you know, there's the yeah. reverse really <laughs> with, yeah. within. You're a trader, uh, but you're going the right way. Absolutely. Uh, but the other thing is um, what it leads me to think, and this is, I often sit there at Landcom and think when we make a decision, um, what mistakes are we making today? And it's a bit like anybody who right now banked their whole business on how people will live after, um, after COVID will be bloody brave or incredibly stupid. But the, the fact is that back then that made perfect sense. And so what you know, we're making decisions today, we hope we'll hold. And you're, you're going up, you're not just linear development where well, you've now got a bit of high rise to the Yeah, we have. Well, well, it's the whole, I mean, Bob we now build, and... yeah, we now build communities with better density around the transport mode, which makes perfect sense. Just as if you go to Summer Hill or Petersham or something, you get the shops with the top shop top housing near near the old, well, we're doing the 2020 um, uh, equivalent of that, which is higher stuff around the stations, which makes more sense. It also yeah. means the whole place doesn't look the same. And that's quite important. You know, there, there, there will always be, and one, one of the, uh, sort of now undermining exactly what I said two minutes ago is how are people going to live? And I always say, if more people are going to work from home, guess what you need? You need a home. And that changes Western Sydney as well, uh, Chris, because everybody thinking I'm living in this part of West, Western Sydney, how far away from town is it? The city is just the wrong decision. It's the wrong way to look at these things. It's how close is it to Wollongong? How close is it to the hills? How close is it to wherever? So for all those reasons, I think- yeah, The access has shifted. It, oh, massively. And, and so what does it mean? Does it mean that a place like Glenfield will have job hubs or work hubs where you work at home, but every once in a while you want to collaborate with a local solicitor. So you go up to the job, the, the work hub up the road, or you need better equipment than you've got at home for, for video conferencing or whatever it might be. Yep. So, you know, people- It might also have a faster things. rail station popping there at some stage too. And suddenly the Canberra above. is in yeah. play and um, the Goulburn's in play for yeah. you know, Jeff Roberts' spiritual home of Goulburn. <laughs> yes, you know, you right. can 
sent him back to play in Melbourne for mm. the, the chairman. I mean, all, all I'd want to say, and I yeah. reckon you would agree, Chris, is is um, it is an exciting time to be involved in the future of Sydney because so many things, and it's not a political comment, so many things have aligned all of a sudden, probably not since the winning of the Olympics and the Olympics themselves and all of that build up over seven years. We've probably never had such an exciting time. Um, and, you know, w w I think we'll get more right than we'll get wrong. And it was pretty exciting before a global pandemic came along. But yes. but thinking about that, that even, you know, the, the best spin you could put on that and you know, touch wood or thank, thank our first responders and everything else, we haven't been as hit as the rest of the world here. But it does present blokes like you and I the chance to think about hasten reform. How we change yeah. things even more. Never yeah. let a good crisis go on leverage. Yeah. Um, last one on Landcom, I'll ask a couple of personal things. Uh, where do you think it leaves Landcom as that, as that um, uh, the first responder in, in, in housing? Um, where, where do you think, what's your sure. help telling you about post COVID, the way we're all going to live? Well, Chris, you made an important point, and, and Landcom fulfills a number of roles. One, of course, the supply of housing, and in times that's government pushed, you know, push a prime prime pumped to housing potentially, along with other areas of yep. government. The other thing we do is we, we exist to be an exemplar because my experience has been you can write as much down in the planning documents as you like, but yep. every once in a while you wander past the development and say, my God, that's ugly. And somebody says, yes, but it's complying. <laughs> because and you, you have a wonderful photo you can show where your development's next to another development in Sydney. And uh, that's right. the other and development I'm, is possibly the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Of sure, Scar. sure. And we can do that. And so we're doing it right and exemplifying stuff is important. And yep. probably the best example of the last 20 years, and I give great credit to the old boss here, Sean O'Toole, yep. no, well known in Western Sydney for this, is the terraces we did out at Thornton in Former Western Dallas, Sydney so. Commissioner, District Commissioner. Yes, so. the, 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 uh, the, the, the terraces, the modern, ter the 21st century terraces, we call them, everything that's old is new again, Chris, um, <laughs> over the other side of Penrith Station, the old defence land. They look fantastic. They sold like hotcakes. Um, and people love living there. It's around an old, uh, well, what was an old oval, a restored oval. So being able to do those things. And at Landcom, we're in an interesting corporate position. We don't care who copies us. Everybody in town can copy us. Uh, we invite them to copy us. And, and the thing we're looking to exemplify at the moment in, in post-COVID in particular, and this is very much a thought of Rob Stokes, who's our portfolio minister, is more affordable housing. And yeah. one of the things I've... Um, yelled a bit from the, the rooftops on is let's get affordable housing at the airport right at the beginning. Let's not retrofit it in 15 years time because everybody says and they're right, there'll be $250,000 tech jobs and ag, ag jobs and all the like. Someone's still got to clean the floor, flush the toilets, yep. um, sell the coffees. And those people are going to be key workers who need affordable housing. And why at the beginning of this would we condemn them to three hours travel a day if we can do some stuff around for affordable housing? So our projects all have 5% affordable housing. It's the ultimate disadvantage in Sydney always is proximity to your workplace. It always has know, been, always that, will be. We've got to take yeah. that on. Well, I was born in Balmain Hospital around the corner from you. I've always lived in suburban Sydney. The one thing I'm not proud about to be a Sydney sider is that we're the second most expensive city in the world. How, did, how the hell did that happen? How did we all let that happen? We all bear a bit of responsibility for that, but we can begin to fix it. There's something about it. Yeah, we can. And, and, and it means that, you know, I live on a, up on the northern beaches of Sydney, a high income part of, of Sydney. And I look at the staff who I pay when I fill up my car and I pay at Woolies and all that sort of stuff. And none of them live around the corner. You know, they're, they're doing three hours a day or they're living with 10 other people. Or, in or increasingly, somewhere. the children of the people in the fancy houses won't be able to live anywhere near yeah. mum's dad live as well. Yeah. And that's when it'll personalise in a bit that your own children yep. uh, can't get in the marketplace. So, and and, and let me give it. you a, a fascinating um, snippet on this. I was down at Bill Gola Surf Club on the Barbie for nippers. And one of the blokes came along who I used to be on patrol with and we had a chat and he said, oh, I'm the... I'm, I'm, what are you doing? I'm the deputy principal, and I won't tell you which suburb, but it's an old Landcom development. Deputy principal at this school. I said, oh, yeah, I know that Landcom. And he said, uh, I said, how's it going? He said, we're getting seven demountables. And I said, hold on, hold on. Hold on. That suburb and that school is no, is no older than about 10 years. How's it possible we got the planning so wrong that we didn't build the school right? And he said, what we didn't anticipate, John, is three families living in one house. Yeah. So not three kids going to school, nine kids going to school. And what that recognises, yet again, for immigrants to Australia, uh, three families in one house is luxury compared to what they lived in before. And such yeah. is their willingness 
to to join in to sign on to the Australian dream and have their son and daughter become a doctor uh, or whatever it might be, such is that commitment that they will crowd into a house. And we hadn't anticipated that. But if the, if the, the city was more affordable, they wouldn't have to do that. Well, it's our future. Hey, mate, I'll finish with, we've been through this, we're still in some parts going through this massive uh, pandemic and transformation of nature um, and how it affects all of us, not just our work, but how we live. You've had your own transformation and big shifts in recent years before the rest of us had to you know, face this. Coming out of COVID, how are, how are you different? How are you different, you know, uh, husband, boss, family guy, citizen? What do you change? What, what do you, what's your, how's your perspective changed by all of this we're dealing with? Well, of course, first, Chris, I'll never disrespect toilet paper again. I mean, you know, it is honor, very... honor the roll. <laughs> honor the roll. It used to be electoral rolls for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> but yes, honor, honor the roll. No, for me, look, I might be, uh, every time I say this, people, people say, no, no, I'm in this category too. I loved having the children at home. Our three are 16, 14, and 12. They, we didn't have to teach them. I feel for people who had little ones. Um, and just having... None the of three-year-old, now four-year-old. Yes. Well, Not yeah, there you go. Time. None of us, um, none of us, doing public transport morning or driving in morning or afternoon. We had so much more time together. It suited one of our three more than the other. So he went from good marks to really good marks because he was really focused. So we had a we had a fantastic time. Um, like you, I've got a dad who's in his 80s, so we had to up the yep. care for him. Um, but he had a you know once once he settled in, once he realised that he doesn't need to be out every day anymore, he he had a good. Um, had a good lockdown, and I don't know about uh, your old man, but uh, we JJ spent a lot. Stuck. He said he only goes out for funerals, but he stayed <laughs> to get out a little more. Well, we we spent a couple of weeks uh, doing FaceTime with my father, talking to his forehead because he couldn't quite work out where to put the phone. <laughs> um, but for the broader family, it's it's been okay for me. Um, so what, of course, what we all miss is the bumping into somebody when you get a cup of tea or something or somebody in and out of a meeting or all of those work things have disappeared. So what I've done and what I've asked my team to do is just to spend just to spend more time dropping in to see how your staff are. Um, so, you know, you, yeah. you call them, don't email them, call them or hang on after a meeting and say, hey, have you got five seconds, Chris, and how's it going? And so w w we spend a lot of time, I try and start most of my one-on-ones with how you're going and how's the team and is everybody all right? And because of my experience with my mental health, with, with uh, my own depression, suicidal ideation, my role in Lifeline and the way I talk about it, it, people, and I'm really happy about this, people in our joint feel happier, feel very free to talk to me about their own mental health. So we had one or two staff who just were- You become were, father confessor. Instantly. Yeah, which is great, which is great. And they know they won't be judged because because I'm not there to judge them. But we had staff for whom oh, mum, dad, and two kids around the table was diabolical. Just diabolical, I couldn't yeah. get any work done and all that sort of stuff. I've had meetings with people where the little ones run in and, you know, why can't we play and all that sort of stuff. So you can, that's cute for a couple of days, but it's not cute for three months. So it's we've done a lot more caring We've done a bit more comms. So we used to have a quarterly meeting of all staff. We're now doing monthly webinars. So it's come together. Yeah, yeah. calling on a guest speaker. We've got Shane Fitzsimmons talking to us about, um, about uh, Resilience New South Wales. So trying to look for those opportunities for contact, a little bit of fun stuff here and there as well. So it's been a bit more of that. Although the, the one thing is the staff morale is fantastic because most of them are enjoying working from home. And the thing that they're worried about, Chris, coming back to work, isn't the job, isn't the workplace, it's public transport. The worry is getting jammed into a into a train with you know 50 other. Now I know the government's handling that, but um, that's the real concern. We don't think we've lost much in the way of productivity, which has been fantastic. Are you going to be designing homes now with the bigger home office? Is it well, literally coming to design? Well, we had a meeting. Uh, we we're, we're doing a transaction at the moment, and I said to the the people on the other side of the table, "Are you? All, is it now going to be two bedrooms and a proper office?" He said, "Yeah. Look, proper. Here's an interesting, Chris. Proper office, not a nook anymore." and a room with a window. So we can't, you can't be jammed in a room without a bloody window all day. So almost overnight, everybody's turned it into a proper office, whether it's a, a bedroom slash office, but it's no longer a nook in the corner. Where my nook at home has a lot of traffic behind it and a yeah. lot of three-year-olds sitting in my lap. She's, yeah. got, she's got to know everybody I've ever worked with in the last yeah. three months. So She'll uh, get the gift of the gab then, won't she? Um, yeah. but, but it's interesting. So yes, that's changed. And that's why I think work hubs will change. You know, you'll be able to wander up the street and have your bite of lunch, but also do a bit of um, more more open meeting. It's funny, I've never been so productive when I'm at home all day, but, um, and you churn through work, but you do get a little lonely, let's face it, you know, and this is great, this is great, but it's not as good as a, you know, uh, it's, it's, we're becoming better, but it's not as easy to have a house of family chat 
Um, so well, look, for me, I'll, I'll, I'll shout you about the room of view as soon as you, as soon as we can, my friend. I'll be um, there. I should say, uh, John Brogdon, my old man, says you're the second best bloke to ever come to us in Pat Strathfield. <laughs> he humbly, he humbly offered up uh, about so a thousand years after he did. <laughs> Yeah, I'm assuming he was the first or Tom Keneally. Yeah, no, I think, he, he, I think he, no, he, he, he put himself in the first category. Yeah. And uh, congratulations. I think the Tigers are finally not ninth on the table. God which bless. Is God bless. Nine, nine yeah. is your favourite number. Yes. Um, yeah, I, was born in, I was born in 1969, described. which is when they, when they won the grand final, the last Balmain Tigers um, victory at the grand final. My mother reminds me I wasn't conceived in 1969 in Balmain. She said there was a very significant bump nine months later at Balmain Hospital Maternity Ward. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, mate. Thanks for your time and thanks, thanks for Brownie, and thanks for, for everything you guys one do. One of those institutions for the region. Um, it re really does matter. Thanks, mate. See you, mate. See you.